So this is our second sermon on Jericho. I was or, or originally going to preach on the Word of God for these five weeks, but after I got back from Africa, I preached on uh, one, one topic on the Word of God, and then I said I'm, I, I felt uh, impressed to change, and so I thought I would um, preach on Jericho, uh, two sermons in the Old Testament, two sermons in the New Testament. I had never preached on the city of Jericho before, even though it was a very rich city, a very large city. You can, you can go to the town today, but it was a very influential city back then in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And um, we began last week with uh, a keep on marching around the city, how Jericho was uh, um, defeated by people marching around the city. And then today we're going to be talking about I, the city of Ai, and how it was in, uh, they in initially defeated the Israelites. We're talking about the danger zone. You know, the danger zone in the Christian life is not when things are going bad. When things are going bad in your life, that's the safe zone. But when things are going good in your life, that is the danger zone as far as spirituality is concerned. And then next week, we're going to talk about Bartimaeus, and then the following week about Zacchaeus. You know, Luke kind of lands, uh, lines up those two uh, people. Uh, he first meets Bartimaeus, who's blind from birth, and Jesus heals him as he's going into the city of Jericho. And then the last time Jericho is mentioned is when uh, he goes over and has lunch with Zacchaeus. I imagine it was a pretty nice place that Zacchaeus had. We're going to talk about Zacchaeus. So there's kind of a contrast. The next two weeks, you have the poorest of the poor being touched by Jesus, and then you have the richest of the rich being touched. And so it's a very nice contrast. Uh, uh, the next two weeks, uh, the healing of Bartimaeus, and then the um, conversion of Zacchaeus, a very wonderful story. Today we're going to talk about uh, uh, the danger zone. And so last week we talked about uh, keep, keep on marching. And the sermon was about that no matter what happens in your life, we have to get up and keep on marching. You know, we had a very good Sabbath school lesson. We all fall in this life. We all make mistakes. We all um, uh, do things either intentionally or not so intentionally. I remember when I was growing up, <laughs> we um, we uh, used to have uh, um, boys come over to our side yard because we, we, we had kind of a big side yard and we would play football, other games there. And uh, we had three boys um, in our family and there were three boys in the Griffin family. They were, they're another Catholic family. And one day they came over and were playing with us football three on three, and I was the quarterback. And uh, Jimmy Griffin, he was the middle boy, and he was always really easy to cry. He was always crying. And so I have to admit to this congregation, I've, I've never really told this story before, but um, I was the quarterback. Jimmy Griffin was coming in trying to do something to me, and I don't know what got into me, but I intentionally threw the football into his face just to see him cry. Wasn't that horrible? Huh? Just as, and you know, right, right on cue, Elias, he crumpled like a leaf and he started to cry. That was not a very good thing to do, was it, Mark? Not a very, you know, that was something intentional. Intentionally trying to hurt a boy to see him cry. We all do things, sometimes intentionally. Sometimes not so intentional. We make mistakes. You know, as I was driving over here to church this Sabbath, um, I was about an hour away from home. I was in... Uh, um, um, Corona, California, 
I drive up from Escondido, and all of a sudden, I think in my mind, uh, I forgot my shoes. Well, the first thing I'm thinking, you know, I could probably walk around in my socks. You know, this congregation is kind of nice. Dennis probably wouldn't even say something. Bob wouldn't say anything. I said, I forgot my shoes. In fact, my wife texts me. She says, what are you wearing? So I said, uh. So to make a long story short, I went to Walmart. I marched in there with my socks. And I bought some shoes on the Sabbath. What did I say last week? What was the sermon? What do you have to keep on doing? You have to keep on marching, whether you have shoes on or not. You have to keep on marching. So some things intentionally, I didn't leave my shoes unintentional, intentionally. But I am wearing shoes. And I've just confessed that I went to Walmart on the Sabbath to buy shoes. So I have something on my feet. We have to keep on marching, my friends. Whether we intentionally or unintentionally, we hurt people, we hurt ourselves, we hurt God. That's what we have to do. That's who we are. What is the danger zone? Well, um, after they conquered Jericho, you know, when, when, when they saw those big walls and how big the walls were and how small they were. You know, they had the fear of God in them. They trembled. The, the, the Israelites were afraid. How are we going to conquer this, these, these big walls? We don't have battering rams. We don't have weapons. We don't have a bulldozer. We have nothing. And so they have, a, they have fear. They, they tremble. They don't know what to do. Well, that's a good place to be in life, is when you're not quite sure. If you go around thinking you're sure of everything, that's when you're in danger. But it's good to have a little bit of insecurity. It's, it's good to have a little bit of humility because it makes you dependent upon God. And so the Israelites were dependent upon God for those seven days. And so they conquered one of the greatest cities at that time in Canaanite, one of the strongest cities, and they were feeling pretty good. And they started to say, look what, you know, look what we have done. You know, we're stronger than we think we are. Wow. Well, the next city they had to conquer was the city of Ai. AI. And it was a little city. It was a nothing city compared to Jericho. And they say, this will be a piece of cake. And they say to Joshua, the spies sent to I, come back. And they say to Joshua, don't send all the people. This is going to be a piece of cake. No problem. Just just send two or 3,000 men, and it'll be over in an hour, and, you know, we'll just go on conquering the land. So they were pretty confident. And my friends, when you're overconfident, like Peter walking on the water, is that the safe zone or the danger zone? The danger zone. So they go up to I, and the Scripture says, so about 3,000 men went up there from the people, and they fled before the men of Ai. They were defeated, and there were 36 Israelites who lost their lives. How many Israelites lost their lives in Jericho? Zero. But now they go up to Ai, and they think they're pretty hot stuff, and now they suffer their first defeat. It's just like David. You know, David, uh, he, uh, for several years, 
he was on the flight from Saul, the king. And where did he live? Did he live in a penthouse? Did he live in a, uh, in a condominium? Did he live in a tent? Where did he live? In caves. Is that very comfortable living in caves? Would you like to live in a cave? Are there beds in cave? Are there toilets in cave? Are there hot showers in caves? Is there a refrigerator in caves? You know, this is a pretty difficult time. And he's on the run. But you know, when David is living in caves and on the run, is he in a danger zone or a safe zone? He's in a safe zone because he's depending upon God. When was David in the danger zone? When he became king. And he was all that. And then he fell with Bersheba. Hmm? When was Joseph tempted? When he was in prison? No, he was tempted when he was the head slave in the house. So my friends, it's much easier to live the spiritual life when your life is down than when it's up. The danger zone is not when you're down. When you're down, you're humble, you're dependent. Yes, it's painful, but it breeds it, it, it breeds a reliance upon God. But once you get out of danger and you get out of trial and you get some money and you get some time and you get other things, you tend to forget about God. That's what the Laodicean problem is. I'm rich and increased with goods. I have need of nothing. I don't need God. I don't need other people. And they get in the danger zone. So what does God say to Joshua? Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, there are devoted things in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. So God tells Joshua, the reason why you were defeated is because there are some things in the camp that are a curse to you and not a blessing. What are the devoted things? Well, God had told them right before Jericho had been defeated in Joshua 6, God said to Israel, but keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction, lest you bring trouble upon Israel. Everything in Jericho was to be destroyed. God said this first conquest of the land, everything belongs to me. And you are to destroy it. It isn't for you. Now you have to understand, <laughs> Jericho is not a Walmart type of city. It's a Macy's a Nordstrom's, a Burberry. I mean, it is a high-class, upper-middle-class, rich, wealthy city. But God said, this first city, everything belongs to me, and I want you to destroy everything as an offering to me. You are not to take anything out of the city. Everything is to be destroyed. And when God said everything, what did he mean? Everything he meant. Not only all the houses, everything in the houses, but also all the people. Everything in the city was to be destroyed. Can we comprehend that? Everything. Men, women, children, doctors, people in the hospital. Can we comprehend what that means? Everything was to be destroyed. Well, Pastor Park, why would God say that? Everything being destroyed. Well, one way that I look at it is... Um, if I go to the hospital and they say I have stage three cancer inside of me, how much of that cancer 
do I want the surgeon to get out of me on the day of the operation? 90% of it? 50% of it? All of it. Now, it might be that there were some people worthy of salvation in the city, and by God's grace, they might be raised to everlasting life. That's a possibility. But my friends, sometimes you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, and Rahab knew that the city was destined for destruction. And she hit the, she hit the soldiers, and she was saved out of all those people. So they had an opportunity to be saved. But they all went down together on the Titanic that was called Jericho. God said further, but all silver and gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. See, you can't burn silver and gold. You can't burn metal. So God said, well, since you can't burn it, I want you to take all that, the silver and the gold and the metal. I want you to give it to the treasury of the Lord, to the sanctuary, to the operation of the sanctuary. So that's what God told them right before the conquest of Israel, the conquest of Jericho. <clears throat> so, the next day, after God tells Joshua, someone has taken some stuff from Jericho and has hidden it, and and you are to find out who it is. So they gather Israel together. There's like a million people there. There's 12 tribes, and they start casting lots to decide who this person is. Now, the person standing there, there's a million people, and the person is probably feeling no one will find out that it was me. Is that a very good strategy when God is the judge? Does God know? Does God have a videotape of that person taking what he took and hid it in his tent? Was it any mystery to God who it was? There was no mystery. God could have told Joshua, it's Achan of the tribe of Judah. But God wanted to give Achan a chance to raise his hand before he was pointed out. And maybe if he would have raised his hand and come forward and said, I'm sorry, I took these things before he was pointed out, maybe God would have allowed him to live. But they start casting the lots. Achan is from the tribe of Judah. He's the guy who took the devoted things. So they cast a lot. It's a 12 and 1 chance it comes to Judah because there's 12 tribes. Boom. It's Judah. They cast a lots again. And then it comes to this clan. And Achan says, uh-oh, that's my clan. Then they cast a lot of lots again. Oh, now it's my family. And then they cast a lot again, and now it's him. So Joshua comes to Achan. God has not revealed to Joshua just what he's taken and he talks to him like a father talks to his son. He says, oh, son, what, what have you done? And this is what Achan says. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar, that's Babylon, and 200 shekels of silver, and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels. By the way, I, uh, I calculated according to the weight of the shekel, by today's um, um, commodity market, uh, 50 shekels of gold and, and 200 shekels of silver is worth about $50,000. So this is not a little bit amount of money. Could, could, could you imagine what $50,000 would be um, uh, uh, 3,500 years ago? You know, you're probably talking uh, several million dollars at least. This is a lot of money. Then I coveted them and took them. And see, they are hidden in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath. 
So you can always tell when something is wrong when you want to hide it. Is that right? You hide it. He didn't go around to his tent mates and say, hey, I took something from Jericho, because they all knew that that was wrong. Whenever you want to hide something, there's usually guilt associated with it. What did Adam and Eve do when they sinned in the garden? They hid, and people have been hiding ever since. So God knew it was Achan, and then Achan explained what he took and where he, he um, hid it. Now, it's very interesting about, I had never seen this before until last night, but how Achan and Rahab, the two stories here, are related. Uh, last night, I was um, thinking about the sermon, and so I go to YouTube. I say, well, I wonder if anyone has a uh, comment about this, because it's it, at the end here, it gets a little sticky. And so I'm looking, and I'm looking for a short video. Don't give me 50 minutes, please. I, I want to hear it in five or six minutes. So I see this guy that I know this scholar named Craig Keener, K-E-E-N-E-R. He's a very, very famous, uh, well-known New Testament scholar, uh, Protestant, very, very well-known. I never read any of his stuff, but but he's extremely well-known. And he had a seven-minute sermon on, or a seven-minute explanation on Aiken. I said, good, I will see what Dr. Keener has to say. And he brought up a very interesting point. He pointed out that here Rahab hid the servants and she was blessed. Achan hides the gold, hides the gold and he's cursed. You see the story here. Both of them have to do with hiding but one gets blessed, the other gets cursed. And so it shows that here you have this Gentile prostitute woman who repents of her life, who resolves to follow the word of God, who hides the soldiers, and the soldiers tell her, when the time comes, you get everyone in your house you get all your family in your house because her act of hiding the soldiers not only blessed her, it blessed everyone in her family. You get all your family members, and what are you to throw outside your house for the soldiers to know who you are? What are you to cast outside your window? The scarlet rope that represents salvation and the gospel. Because this person believes in the blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of her sins. Did this person need forgiveness of her sins? Of course, she's a prostitute. She lived on the wall. You know, I imagine that was like living in Bradbury. That, you know, you kind of have a city, city light view. A city light view is going to cost you. Is, is that right, Mary? City light view? It's... It, it's, it's going to cost you more money. You know, if you have two houses on the street and, and the house on this side has a beautiful view and the house on the other side of the street doesn't have any view, guess what? The house who has the view is more costly. So here you have Rahab. She's up on the wall. She has a city light view. She's been fairly successful, but she repents. And she depends upon Jesus. She has faith in the God of Israel. And she's not only saved, but her household as well. On the other hand, Achan also hides something in his tent. And he hides the devoted things. And God now brings the curse. And this is where the story gets, how shall I say, um, 
a little difficult. Hmm. A little difficult. I mean, I think he, we in here in, in 2024, we can say amen to Rahab and her house getting saved. And because Rahab did the right thing, her and her house were saved. But you look on the other side of it, now Achan, which I think God, uh, uh, I, I, for the first time I saw Joshua, kind of puts these two stories together. What happens when you're not faithful to God, to you and your family? Well, let's see what happens. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan the son of Zerah and the silver and the cloak and the bar of gold and his sons and daughters, and his oxen and donkeys, and sheep, and his tent, and all that he had, his cell phones, his computers, his car, well, all he had, and they brought them up to the valley of Achor. Does this seem like something good is going to happen or something bad? How much does he take of this man's property? Everything. What happens to him? <laughs> ay, 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 ay. And Joshua said, why did you bring trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you this day. Because of Achor's unfaithfulness, 36 Israeli soldiers died. 36 men died because God cannot go with them and bless while this accursed thing was in the camp. Then it says, And all Israel stoned him with stones. They burned them with fire and stoned them with stones. What did they do? They not only stoned them to death, but they burned everything. Does that seem a little harsh to you? Hmm? A little harsh? Hmm? A little harsh. You know, this, this is what could have happened to Rahab and her family. So God is willing to save. God is able to save to the uttermost all those who come to him. Amen? Amen. As Peter Marshall one time preached, God can save from the guttermost to the uttermost. Amen? The guttermost to the uttermost. But Achan, Achan had coveted, and instead of destroying what God had said is his, He took it. He coveted it. He hid it. And instead of confessing his sin, you know, as soon as he saw the children of Israel coming back from I defeated, he should have gone to Joshua. It's my fault. And I, I put myself in, in the merciful hands of God. But he never did. He never did. And he was destroyed. What a sad thing. You know, we're studying today. Thank you, Rudy, again for the Sabbath school lesson. Revelation 14. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. And God's judgment includes saving Rahab on the one hand and condemning the Achans on the other. You know, there's only the sheep and the goats, the Cains and the Abels. There's both sides to the gospel. Even the most famous verse in the Bible has judgment. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, what, believes in him should not, what, Mm -mm. There it is. Should not perish, 
you know, the gospel is not only kumbaya. You know, uh, uh, that was a popular folk song in my day. Kumbaya means come by me. Kumbaya, my Lord. Kumbaya. Kumbaya, my Lord. Kumbaya. Very sweet song. Kumbaya. The gospel is kumbaya. But also, on the other hand, what I think in this early story of Jericho, as we'll see next week, the next two weeks there's a contrast between the rich Zacchaeus and the super poor Bartimaeus, and God saves them both. And in this first two stories of Jericho in the Old Testament, we have Rahab, the prostitute, is saved, and Achan, who is a child of Israel, who's, a, who, who's from the tribe of Judah, he is wiped off the face of the earth, along with his family. <laughs> I remember the first time I ever heard this uh, story about Achan. I, w I was a brand new Adventist. I had just got baptized, and I was attending the Elmshaven Church in St. In, in Helena, California. Actually, it was at the hospital. It was a hospital church, St. Helena Hospital, the health center. And actually, they had a contest before I got there to name their town, their post office. And they named their town Deer Park. D-E-E-D-E-R. Deer Park. So I used to be Jim Park from Deer Park. I liked it. Jim Park from Deer Park. I was going to this church. It was a very conservative church, an excellent church. I mean, we had the who's who of Adventism there because they had retired. We had Elder Figure, who was the former General Conference president. We had W.B. Oaks, who was the former General Conference treasurer. We had Elizabeth Reidelstein, who was called the China nurse. She was, at the, she was at the Nuremberg trials in Germany, and she also was the personal nurse to Chiang Kai-shek in Taiwan. We had some very famous people there in the congregation. The average age of the congregation was probably around 70 years old. Everyone had a black suit, not, not even a gray suit. Uh -uh. Everyone had a dark suit and tie and a white shirt. That was the dress code of that church. So I was a new member. I remember sitting there, and the pastor who baptized me, Dwayne Grimstad, great pastor, he was going to introduce the youth pastor, the new youth pastor, at the end of the sermon. And so he introduces the youth pastor, and this new youth pastor walks out, believe it or not, in the context. I mean, it would have been worse with me showing up with no shoes on. He showed up, I kid you not, with a maroon leisure suit with white shoes. I mean, he, you know, even dressed down Jim, I was like horrified. I mean, he was like the Pat Boone. You know, Pat Boone used to wear white shoes all the time. I said, is this the Pat Boone of Adventism? A maroon leisure suit with white shoes? I mean, people are going, <gasps> I says, who is this guy? Well, about two or three months later, he comes and talks to me. He says, I would like to come visit you on Friday night. I said, wow. I think the pastor put him up to it. Go visit Jim Park. I, I just baptized him. So I was living, I was trying to think about it last night. I was living in this tiny little shoebox home. It had just enough room for a bed. It had a tiny bathroom and a tiny kitchen. I, th I don't think it was much over 120 square feet. Okay. 
$50 a month. And the pastor was going to come over and visit me. Well, he comes over, and he visits me, and I soon understand that he has no interest in me. The only reason why he came over and visited me is that he wanted to invite me to a program. He's very uncomfortable doing that. In fact, I didn't know about it, but talking with Diana, who happened to live right across the street from me at the time, he also visited her and invited her to a program. So I'm going, who is this guy? Four or five months later, Pastor Grimstad got up and he preaches a sermon on the sin of Achan. First time I ever heard that story, he says there's sin in the camp. And he's referring to this pastor apparently had got involved, uh, had difficulty in his marriage. I, I didn't quite know what happened. By, but I, I know he left his wife, and he began working for a contractor um, who, was a, who was a member of the church. I would see him around the area pouring cement, etc. And this is really the first time I was acquainted with with, 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 with someone being disciplined in a way by the church. Uh, you know, I tell people, my friends, <laughs> no one in their right mind would ever become a pastor unless they're called of God. Um, the hours are unlimited. The pay is somewhat meager. The troubles are plenteous. And this poor person, I don't think he ever was called to be a pastor. Very uncomfortable. Really didn't know what to do. And, you know, whenever I saw him after that, I really felt sorry for him. I really did. I don't know. I, I, I never talked with him about it. He was a little older than I was. But the church had to, um, because I think of a moral failing of, of the pastor, um, um, they had to inform the conference, and then the conference had to um, exercise um, discretion and ask the person to leave the ministry. Now, folks, I'm not wise enough <laughs> to construct for you an adequate theology or explanation of why Achan and all of his family were taken um, out of the camp and everything he owns, including sons and daughters and wife and the whole thing. And they are not only stoned, but, but, but they're burned with fire. Seems a little harsh. To my 2024 understanding. But as part of the Word of God, the story, the, the story puts Rahab, the prostitute who saved and hides the spies, with Achan, the Israelite who hides the devoted things in his tent, and one becomes, Rahab becomes part of the line of Jesus, according to Matthew. She's the great, 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 great grandmother of uh, David. She becomes part of Jesus' line, and Achan becomes, his name, in fact, means trouble. That's what his name means. Imagine giving your kid the name of trouble. That's what Achan means, trouble. And he made trouble for Israel. And so I can't, as a human being, I cannot say why it happened or justified why it happened, that type of punishment. All I know, it is in the Bible. And you know, Jesus encourages us. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. How many words? 
Every word. We can't pick and choose what words. And some of the words make us very uncomfortable. It makes me uncomfortable. I mean, I wish there was some way to redeem the guy, but apparently according to God's message, one thing I can guarantee from then on, when God said, destroy it, what did the people do? <laughs> they were obedient. This isn't mine. This is God's. God said, destroy it. I'm not to covet it. I'm not to take it. I'm, I am to leave it alone. I'm going to burn it, even though I'm tempted. $50,000 is a lot of money. It's not mine. It's God's. I'll put it in the treasury, whatever it's going to be. We are to live by every word, even though the words that we shake our head at. And yes, people might say, well, what, what, what type of God do you serve? But I also know that sometimes the cancer has to be extricated from the body in order for the body to live, like Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament. So those are our first two stories of Jericho. One's a very success story. The walls come down. Rahab gets, gets, uh, gets uh, rescued. Very encouraging story. Keep on marching. Um, this story is more, I would say, of a warning that we need to be obedient to what God has asked us to do. We need both sides. And then next week we're talking about Bartimaeus. He's blind. The story is not about the healing, physical healing of blindness. It's how God can heal our blindness. Because we're all blind. We're all born blind. How can God heal our blindness? And then the last story, one of my favorite, is Zacchaeus. How Jesus, how Jesus knocked that rich man out of the tree. What Jesus, man, <laughs> an unbelievable story. Zacchaeus, how he converted him. What a wonderful story to end our time in Jericho. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for your grace every single day. We need your grace, Father. Whether we forget our shoes or we intentionally throw a football into a boy's face, whether it's unintentional or intentional, dear Father, we need your grace. Rahab needed grace. She hid the spies and you gave her grace, amazing grace. You made her part of your family. You made her part of your genealogy. You exalted her, Father, her name, despite her profession, despite her background. There's hope for us all, dear Father. On the other hand, we talked about Achan, who should have known better. There were a million people there who followed your directions, but one did not. And because of that, Lord, you said that that cancer has to get out of the camp. I can't have covetousness. I can't have people... Um, disobeying me at point-blank range and making it a spectacle, we pray, dear Lord, that you may help us with the fear of the Lord in our hearts to tread humbly before you, to be a blessing, to love you, to love our neighbors. Give us your grace every single day until you come. In Jesus' name, amen.